Okay, so um, this is Danny Walt. Danny is, uh, he had a boat, and he's gonna, I'm going to ask him a few questions about his boat and what happened, and uh, together we're going to discover some stuff, and along the way there are three or four lessons that we can pick up from his experience. So at his cost, we hope to learn something. Okay, ready? So why don't you just, Danny, tell me a little bit about yourself, and when you use this mic, you're going to pull it right up against your chin. First, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. It's a warm belonging. And thank you for your support. That is also just incredible. It's almost worth, worth it to, for this to happen. And uh, that's all of that. Okay, so why don't you tell me what kind of boat did you have, uh, where did you come from, and is it true that you were a fisherman before? Yes, uh, I have a lot of time uh, on the water. This is my first sailing vessel. It was a 44-foot CNC racing yacht in perfect condition. We worked 1986. Never had been altered. It was just like a showroom Rolls Royce. Um, I had the standing rig redone. Uh, very expensive item, very beautiful item, and I sailed 31 days from Palacios, Texas, to arrive at Ragged Island on Christmas Eve. 31 days non-stop, or did you anchor it somewhere? I had about 30 minutes on the fuel back at Key West. <laughs> wow, 31 days. Solo! So, so. Wow, okay, that's a pretty hardcore right there. But uh, being on the sea as a fisherman day and night, I guess you're used to that kind of thing. So tell me, you told me that uh, when you, before you got to the baggage, you dropped the hook on the bank somewhere and took a rest. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I uh, anchored off the banks uh, about 60 miles from Bragg, uh, two or three days from Christmas. And um, I had an oversized anchor, very nice mantis, by the way. And um, the thing didn't fit on the boat right, so I had altered the chute. I had uh, put an extension on the chute and uh, was anchored up in a gale and found that the uh, chute was chafing the line. And I spent a considerable amount of that time in the evening late with the gale blowing at me trying to uh, mitigate that problem. And uh, in the night, uh, the line chafed through, broke, and I woke up in the morning in the Gulf Stream with the boat happily sailing to Cuba by itself, and uh, turned it around and headed back towards the anchor, which was marked, and had intended to recover the anchor and could not dive on it because of the uh, currents that day. And then um, decided to go ahead and try to make ragged and get the hell off the water. That sounds like a good idea. I think I'd get out of there to get to some land after 31 days of losing that. So you, to get this right, you had a chain plus rope anchor road, and the rope was up against the anchor roller or something, and it chafed off over the night. Is that right? That's correct. It actually, uh, yeah, basically, yeah, the, the custom shoot chafed it through. Okay, so you lost your nice mantis. That's a whole boat unit, right? Thousand bucks. Chain, rope, anchor loss. Lesson number one, chafe protection. And Bill mentioned it on the net the other day, so when we're here walking around and your your anchor and your, your snubbers and your lines are up against the side of your rollers and the, the steel, you need to go up there and look at it once in a while, especially if there's like four or five days just back and forth, back and forth, to make sure nothing's going to snap. And this is what happened with you. And the two thing I had was as robust as I thought it. I thought it could handle it, and it, it, it was not a. It wasn't enough, and I had it wrapped like six, seven times. I mean, I had a lot of chafing on there, and so it just just did not hold. Yeah, that happens, and uh, you know, especially when you're new, you do something new. You got a new sail, or a new line, or a new road. Uh, you modified something up the front. You're gonna possibly have some chafing, and I know I've lost a downwind sail line doing that as well, just sailing in a Georgia line. Boom. 
because of the chafe. We had it all wrong. So you left uh, there. You, you went back to look for your anchor. You couldn't find it because of the currents. And, you know, obviously it's not just something you can just dive around in the middle of the banks to look for. And then you went over to the Ragged's. And what happened over there? Uh, I met a, a guy with the restaurant. And uh, the reputation at the Ragged's is you can't get anything. If you make friends, you have everything. They will bring you everything. They will take care of you. And they brought fuel to my boat. They fed me. They did my laundry. They let me wear their clothes. I, I met many people on the island. And uh, so that's basically what happened. It was one of the finest Christmases I've ever had. Well, it's amazing. The bah Bahamian people are indeed friendly, and I think the more you get away from the bigger towns, especially out to the Ragged's and some of these smaller towns on the other islands, you'll find they're extremely friendly. And giving you a shirt off their back and taking you in for Christmas dinner, uh, after 31 days at sea, I'm pretty sure you didn't look as spruced up as you did today. So that's that's awesome. Good for them. Really good. But you left the, then you left there after Christmas. Uh, you had some immigration thing. Of course, you can't check in in Duncan Town, so you had to come up this way to check in. You decided to come on up, and you stopped at Flamingo Key. Tell us uh, where you parked and where, when, what it was like when you anchored. Okay, at uh, Flamingo, there's two anchorages. I was on the uh, southern anchorage. Uh, the guidebooks say it's no good from the northwest. I will concur. Um, the northern uh, anchorage is supposed to be pretty decent from the northwest. I don't think the flamingos are good from the northwest at all. Uh, the one that on the uh, in the north it's very small. The one in the south is larger. Either one, they're both open to the north, west, and the west. East is good. Uh, the rocky uh, holding is iffy in both places. So I would not recommend the flamingos, obviously. So tell us, you you anchored there anyway because you need to stop or something. And uh, tell us how much, what what kind of ground tackle did you have? Uh, anchor, chain, rope, because you lost your first anchor, so you must have a backup anchor. How much scope did you put out? And what was the weather like when you stopped? Right, the weather wasn't too bad when I stopped. Um, I only had twenty feet of chain. It was a big chain, and I had a either 150, 200 feet of road out and, um, you know, to help because I didn't have much chain. And I anchored, the anchor was set in eight feet of water and I was okay from the, when it was blowing from the east, it blew me out deeper. When it went slack and came from the northwest, it blew me into shallow water. That was probably mistake number one. Mistake number one, did you hear that? Do you know what the mistake was? He, when we teach our anchoring seminars, step number two of the anchoring seminar is find the spot. So find the spot and go around it with your boat all directions. So no matter what happens with the wind, the squall comes up or anything, you are afloat the whole way. You might be close to the cliff, but you got to have the confidence in your anchor. But you need to go all around it to make sure the water is deep enough everywhere. You didn't do that. That's a, that's a mistake. So there's a second mistake in there. And just not to, to point fingers on you, but just so that we can learn and you don't mind me sharing. The second thing is, he had a road of 150 to 200 feet out. Let's just say it's 150 in 8 feet of water. Let's just say his bow is 3 feet off the water, so 11 feet from the roller to the ground. 150 feet. What's the scope? We're talking about 13, 14, right? More than 10. Never, ever put it that much scope. Because if something goes wrong, you're a long way from your hook. you got to come in. And when you look at the benefit of some more scope, the scope is about reducing the angle to your hook. And when you're one to one, of course, it's like this, and then two to one, and then da -da 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 down. And when you get to like seven to one, the scope is seven, your hook, the angle from your hook is about seven percent. You put on another scope to eight or nine or ten, it's going to be seven and a six and a half, six percent. Not much change, there's no payback. Don't put out more scope than you need. Five to seven is plenty. And Donnie here had a scope of like 14 or 15 out. When he ran into trouble, especially as a single-handed sailor, he's got a long way to go to get it all back in. So tell us what happened then. Uh, you say the wind blew you back and you're back in the shallows. You start bumping on the ground. Did the water get rough? Or what, why were you not able to get out and what did you try? 
Okay, here's uh, something that I learned, and it sort of surprised me. When you see a storm coming, uh, when it arrives, it's a storm. It doesn't build. It's a storm when it gets to you. So you'll go from easy water to a storm, snap your fingers, it's there. And uh, I think it actually arrives a little bit before the actual cloud arrives. And so if you have open sea, you know, out to the horizon, it goes further. The, the storm that's coming at you has got many, many miles of fetch before it gets to you. And um, if you're not ready and out before it gets to you, good luck. And the other thing for single-handed sailors, um, if you're in that situation, you cannot move from the bow to your helm in enough time to cover any seaway you might have had. So when you make the trip, you've lost all seaway and all margin of error at that time. And you're in trouble. You're in trouble when, as, as soon as the first wave comes, you're in trouble. And in Donnie's case, you know, you, when, you're, when you see the waves are coming, the storm is coming, he's got to make a decision. He's by himself. If you've got a crew, of course, you can one person on the helm and kind of push the boat forward, hold it in position. The other person go work with the hook or do whatever else is necessary. On your own, you don't have that luxury of additional hands. And so here he is. He's made the decision to try and get the hook out of the water so that he can get out. Now, in retrospect, maybe the better decision would have been just to spend four hours or eight hours on the helm holding the boat in position. You know, he didn't have the luxury of going back and changing his mind on the decision. He made the decision to get the hook out, and it didn't go it didn't go well. Now, you had a dog on board, and uh, you put out a mayday call. What happened then? Okay. Um, somewhere along the list of mistakes is um, I have a dog, and I did not have an abandoned ship plan. I wasn't ready to abandon ship. That's very important. Uh, that could be your life. And uh, when you are in this situation, it gets very dangerous very quickly. And if you're not ready for it, it can, it can spiral out of control and you can be gone very rapidly. Thankfully, uh, that didn't happen to me. And I rode the boat a calamity of about seven or eight minutes. Um, but right before the boat hit the cliff, uh, it was cocked towards the sea. A big wave hit it, cocked towards the rock, and slid on in. Um, on the way into the rock, when I knew it was inevitable, that you know you're hoping the whole time that you you're going to be okay, and then in the last ten. 15 yards, you know, it's over. You know, so I go below to get the dog. And I throw the dog in a cell bag. She was frightened. She knew it was, the thing was all up. And she got in the cell bag real easy. I tied her up and got on the boat, got a line on the cell bag, and we hit the cliff. And by that time, my mayday was there really helping out and uh, could not abandon ship from the seaside. And he told me to climb the cliff, and I had looked at it, didn't think I could do it. Looked at the sea and realized I couldn't do that. Went back and looked at the cliff and realized I probably could do the cliff. And I climbed the cliff and pulled the dog up with the rope. It's amazing when you think you can't do something, but when the other choice is even worse, you actually you can do it after all. So he climbed up the cliff, and, but of course you weren't able. To, you told me you weren't able to get all the way up with the dog. So the guy who was, uh, was there with the Mayday rescue boat, uh, another cruiser, came around the other side of this thing, climbed over the cliff, and helped you up over the top, and uh, got you over to the beach. Is that right? Correct. That's uh, the stand fast. That's Trevor on the stand fast. He was uh, doing some remarkably dangerous things for me. His boat was right on the brake line. He almost lost it a couple of times. Um, you know, just meet a guy in a situation like that, you don't know what you're dealing with, you know. And it turns out he was just super, super people. And uh, to get a chance to meet Trevor, you know, <laughs> tell him a thank you for me. Great. And uh, one of the things, the other lesson to learn, we'll come to questions in just a minute. The other lesson to learn is the ditch bag. How many people travel with a ditch bag? 
If you don't know what a ditch bag is, it's a bag with all your important stuff. So when something goes wrong and you got to get off your boat in five minutes, that's the thing you're going to take. You should in your ditch bag have some water, some food. If you plan to be in your dinghy for a long time, maybe some shade, some fishing gear, uh, a toothbrush, you know, some toilet paper, your passports, passports, your identification, money, your e pub and uh, VHF radio, and your flares. So the thing becomes like 25 pounds of goods, right? We have ours that lays under the table. And when we're at anchor here, it's still laying under the table. But when we're traveling in the open water, it is right under the table where we can get it. Boats don't sink in 30 seconds. You got time to go get your bag, but you don't have time to pack your bag. And like he's he's at an anchorage in the middle of nowhere. You're not expecting to need your ditch bag, but still you got to have your bag handy, especially in the middle of nowhere where nobody else is going to come and just rescue your boat. Something to think about. Make sure that ditch bag is not tucked away and make sure it is ready with all the stuff in it. That's something to learn. And so, Donnie, were you, uh, this is maybe really a stupid question, were you afraid or did you feel like you were covered during this whole thing? I thought you were not going to go there, but that's okay. Um, my faith sustained me. And uh, it's a crazy thing to uh, to not lose your faith when something like that's happening. But that's how strong our Lord is. You know, He'll be there for you. You know, He will be. And uh, it's a very personal thing. It's very hard to even uh, put into words. But He was here with me the whole time. And... Uh, that's one reason why maybe it's a surprise to some people that I'm not so torn up about it. You know, it's just, I believe it's God's will. It's God's will. Thank you very much for sharing. That is, uh, you know, when, when you're up against a cliff, the surf, your boat is going down, and you think you might die, uh, suddenly there's a thing that, oh, maybe God is a real deal after all. I'm going to pray. You might never pray the rest of the week, the rest of your trip, but when you're up against a cliff, 99% of us are going to be praying to somebody or something. And so uh, Donnie had that faith and he had that comfort, and he's not torn up about losing his boat. Let's give it up for Donnie. Well, thank you, everybody. Oh, well, hang on. You're not off that's easy. People might want to ask a question. You have no question? Okay. Yeah. Did he have insurance? Uh, I did not have the Bahama endorsement. I uh, assumed the risk. So that's a risk we take, right? You think, oh, I don't need insurance. I'm going to be okay. It's like having a house without any insurance. You know, normally if, you, if you've got the bank and you can give it back to the bank, okay, but I don't think you were going to give this back to the bank. So uh, that's something to think about. We think insurance is expensive, but when you need it, it's like a life raft. The life raft is also expensive. When you need it, there's not enough that you can't pay for it. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, in the picture, it looked like your head sail was out. And so I, was, I didn't hear the part where the sail, where you got the sail out and the anchor. Uh, the cliff, I think, severed the uh, roll of furrowing line, and uh, the wind unfurled it. Yeah. yeah. You definitely weren't trying to sail on the anchor. You have enough on your hands already. <laughs> okay, other questions, anybody? Yeah. I just want to know what the sea conditions were like when all of this was happening. What type of waves, how big? Uh, it was almost calm just before and went to uh, two to three in ten minutes or less. It just it, it got big almost in, immediately, almost immediately from calm. Wind speed. What is the wind speed is the question. It wasn't too bad. Uh, 25 maybe. Yeah, so you think everything should just be okay, right? We should handle it. But as a solo sailor especially, or even as a crew, you start to make a mistake and you run out of time, you don't have options. And let this be a lesson. If you've got crew and uh, your crew is not capable of doing the same job as you do, you might as well be, almost be a solo sailor, sailor. Or if you have a crew that don't even know anything about sailors sailing, I've had that before, and you ask them to do stuff, it's even worse than doing it by yourself. So be very careful. Make sure that if you're sailing together as a couple and you haven't had both of you take training and sailing, both of you know how to do each other's roles, that's something you really should consider because we don't want to have another seminar where we're hearing a story about, well, I should have taken that or he should have done this training or I should have done that. 
I have a question uh, concerning the role of Trevor in this kind of more the timeline. How soon did he show up and what kind of boat or dinghy did he have or any words of wisdom if somebody's trying to help? How to help? The question is, uh, the, the guy who responded to the Mayday call, uh, does he have words of wisdom to share and how did, what was he concerned about? Um, yeah, I think it was a, a real sudden response we had to have. And um, from my side, I would have liked us to be better prepared as well. Um, I, I received a Mayday call and said, okay, I'll come across um, on, on, the, on our dinghy and come have a look and see what's happening and what needs to be done. I think perhaps I should have got some more information from Don at that point in time because um, we obviously had to first lower our dinghy which lost a bit of time and then we headed, a, I headed across there and um, by that time he was drifting quite bad, he, was, he wasn't on the rocks as yet so we decided, uh, I said well give me your anchor, I'll go take it out and we'll try anchor the boat, get the boat steady uh, to which he said well he doesn't have an anchor anymore so I then returned to my boat to go get the spare anchor that I had on the boat. Um, but unfortunately, that hadn't been jigged up and ready to go. So I had to still do some work on jigging it up and getting it loaded into tender. Um, by which time, when I got back to Don, um, he was already against the rock. So perhaps a lesson out of that is to make sure all your backup equipment is ready to go and uh, that you find out better information before you... Because Don was probably about 10 minutes or 10, 15 minutes. Because uh, the wake was really big. I mean, it was probably, it felt like uh, 15 foot, but it was probably it was probably about 10, 12 foot when right next to the boat where Don was. So it was quite a quite a challenge getting close to the vessel. But um, with hindsight, had we found out better information beforehand, perhaps we could have responded better and perhaps helped him save the vessel. Okay, thank you. What time of day did all this happen anyway? No, 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 no. Uh, no, it was early morning. Uh, we, we arrived there probably at 9 a.m. and uh, Don contacted us to say, well, we see you here and uh, we had a bit of a chat in the morning and I said, well, let's, let's meet up late in the day. I'm just going to have a bit of a sleep. I've been traveling overnight um, and literally an hour later, hour and a half later, I received uh, this Mayday call. Well, the question was, uh, is the, was the engine running? And uh, he said, yes, the engine was running. Could he get off, couldn't get off the rocks with an engine. It was too shallow because he kept bumping a gun. Uh, what size and type uh, was your secondary anchor? I believe it was uh, maybe a 30-pound damper. And it, it held good. And where well, I used it, it ragged. It, uh, it sat there in the blow for several days with no problem. Anything else? Otherwise, let's hear it up for Danny. Danny and... Uh, Come on, talk to me if you like. Thank you all for coming out. That's great.